All right. Uh, so yeah, I, during your break, I have even written out this beautiful expression because I wanted to fret a little bit more on it as you just to show you its beauty. Okay. And I mean, for you to understand it more, see, um, we basically take our data X, right? And we are trying to describe it basically with some artificial stuff, right? That we are, that comes from our model, right? Which is vector B, right? And C, very important. Uh, absolute value of X, the length of X, contributes the length, the scale, to our description, okay, nothing else, just about scaling, okay? B contributes the direction, right? So that your vector points along vector, your data vector X, or as close as possible, okay? This is how we found B, right? This is how we find B, because we find B to be, to have the smallest possible angle between B and your data, okay? So what this means? It means that vector B contributes to the data, but only so much, only as much as it has in common with the data X, okay? So this is very important because you will see this reincarnation of this kind of rule almost everywhere. And again, as I already mentioned to you, the harmonic analysis where you compute Fourier transforms, they're exactly the same thing. You're explaining your data with your basis vectors and your basis vectors are matched against the data or the data matched against the basis vector. And the amount of similarity between the data vector and the the basis vector, which is your, each of the harmonics, right? Determines the amount of contribution of this guy to the general picture, to the description, to describing your data, okay? Very similar thing here, except that we have to find B ourselves. We have to find B. We are restricted in this case because we have forward model, EG forward model. So B cannot be just any. It has to be, it has to be B of R right and you need to find r which maximizes this this cosine right or minimizes the angle between b and x okay so now let's do some plotting here um let me share the screen for you okay right so we again go to this MATLAB script. Okay, again, uh, I will not be like explaining you every line of the script, of course. You can go over it, it's pretty intuitive. It's kind of, I mean, maybe ugly, but it, it's intuitive and has some uh, some commands to it. Uh, and, uh, but the good thing about the script I mentioned is that it, it starts from the very basic principles. It basically doesn't use anything beyond the standard uh, to MATLAB things, right? And then it has some functions, for instance, right? It has like my Sarvas function, for instance, which uh, which is here again, which is which is very simple function based on what we worked with you during the lectures, okay? Uh, and this is forward model for the spherical, spherical forward model, basically. So you can, uh, there is a reason for this, uh, for, for, the, for, for why I'm using the script is because you can always get, go and use it and do step by step all this magic that we are talking about and all this magic that is under the hood of MNA Python, of course, in a much more elegant and maybe maybe like a refined way because you know everything things are streamlined for a better use and some numerical procedures are better designed. But this was just something that I put for you for this class. Of course, I'm not using this to analyze the data, but it it uses basic principles and you basically you shouldn't find anything which was not covered in the class and which is coded here. Okay, okay. So anyway, uh, let us again start from scratch. 
and this is this is a script we use to play with um uh to to, to play with uh to, to to play with the uh with a single value composition okay so yeah so that's the head right that's the head that's the source here and that's the sphere fitted to the location of sensors sensors are shown with uh, this zigzags okay because they have uh, one two three four points and i just plotted them in a row and like line with line command okay uh and then and then this is the activation of a single time course or a single source and that's the noisy time series that we noised okay perhaps we don't want this much noise in this experiment now because i want to first show that everything works and then show how to we break how we break it okay uh so let's redo it um, yeah okay so a little bit better uh so again you immediately should be able to look at it and say that well this is rank one data right because they cross zero at the same point uh and in real life you actually may have rank one data as well or close to rank one data but they may be rank one in one time interval and then they may stop be rank one like another source switched on and they're no longer rank one so you can get your eye trained to look for this rank one activity which is important because this in a way it like indirectly tells you that there is a dipole you can feed there is a dipole you can describe your data with okay now if you select the uh again i will repeat this that this should be closed hey come on uh uh yeah this so uh this is this is again this, this is more this picture is a little bit more correct right it has time on x-axis right i just and it's time units and seconds and we will work with this main slice here which is the 20th slice okay here and we will first display its topography okay so the topography shows you the distribution of activity over sensors right hold on over sensors uh corresponding to i put here 20 right to the uh, to, to the 20th time slice okay it's over here okay so uh and because it's rank one data the topography plotted for every time slice except for maybe this one where there is no signal uh will will look very similar but the shape the amplitude of course the magnitude will be different but because it's it's a scaled to the maximum plot you will not see the difference right any difference well because of some noise maybe a little bit but not more okay so and now we want to do exactly what we did in the lecture we want to see okay g orth is the matrix uh is your forward matrix uh which has 102 rows and 15,000 columns corresponding to 15,000 sources on the cortical grid okay and we don't know where our main source where, where our actual source at and we want to find it okay and remember in the paper no in the lecture notes we started to basically compute the cosine between the forward model which was matrix which was our, our vector b and your data right so we can basically uh, this is exactly what's written here so we compute the see we compute the cross product between the ice column or topography corresponding to the ice source right uh of your forward model and your data time slides that you have selected and you normalize by the norm of this guy and norm of this guy okay and therefore this is simply a cosine okay so you can you can do this you can do this and then and then if you just simply look at this scan this is important to look at first this way and then uh, see i let me explain you what this is on x-axis i have simply the index of a source on the cortex okay and since we have fifteen thousand sources here i have maximum fifteen thousand elements for which this plot exists okay in my 
y-axis, I have the correlation, the cosine between the topography, model topography of each of these source and my data. Okay. And I am lucky here because this guy has the largest value. Yeah, close to one. Largest value among all source locations. Okay, this of course doesn't look smooth because cortex is two-dimensional structure. It's a two-dimensional structure. And we somehow go over it and somehow label the vertices with some sequential indexing, right? We can't make it smooth, right? So it's it all like it's some, some indices are close to the true source. Some indices are far away. And in order to see actually what, what are these guys, how do these like guys look, we need to plot it this way. Okay. And let me do it first this way. Let me do it first with, without the without thresholding. Okay, that's how it looks. Okay, it's not light. It's each each patch is colored with the proportional to the uh, to the cosine the corresponding topography makes with the data. Okay. So see uh, this scale of a cosine of the absolute cosine. Okay, I made the absolute cosine. Uh, in 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 in. Let me see. Let me see if I. Yeah, let's 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 stick with absolute cosine for now. See, the, this yellow dot shows where the source is, where the true source is, uh, and we can see that we have large values, large large sub large cosine values, pretty much, you know, in in a relatively large location area, right? And we can we can we can even imagine that if we had some noise to the data, some more noise to the data, we would be able to quite erroneously localize our source, not to these location but maybe to this one or maybe to this one or maybe to this one right so but at least it gives you some idea where the source is that it's not here not here not here not here but somewhere in this region right which would correspond to the sensory motor region of a foot right right yeah so uh, not of a foot over, over actually a leg not a foot foot is somewhere deeper there okay so uh now uh, let us try and uh, uh, let, let, let us try and uh, see something something more complicated. Okay. So, but for this, I want to show you that I, I want to tell you that basically this this plot, the, this scan, this scan, is exactly equivalent in terms of like information that it brings to us uh, as compared to the um, to, to to ah it's it's for the different yeah let, this is already for the more complicated case let, let let's switch to the more complicated case now but uh uh yeah so basically this gives you this gives you a cosine scan this is you can you can think of it as a subspace scan uh the subspace correlation between the bit because it's simply a cosine in this case between the one dimensional data vector and one dimensional forward model vector but in practice we don't do it this way okay the reason we don't do it this way in practice is because we do not know this orientation of sources very well because we typically extract the cortical surface from the mri data and the mri data may be quite noisy and extracting the cortex from this data requires some mathematical procedures that are relatively complicated software that is implemented in like uh, complex algorithms and it's prone to error especially if you want to work with reasonable amount of vertices if we don't want let's say 150,000 vertices but we want to work with let's say 15,000 vertices okay or even for 150,000 vertices you know the orient the, the orientation and the smoothness of the um, of the cortical surface is not ideal and therefore the orientation of the sources is not known very well okay therefore we want to do something where we can represent our source uh with using some more complicated model okay so that we are not going to be using a fixed orientation over dipole but at each location we will say that our source can have arbitrary orientation it can point to 
arbitrary direction. And we want to find this direction on the one hand, which maximizes the similarity with the data, right? Um, yeah, and period, okay? So uh, to do that, we need to, we need to uh, go over some more mathematics here. And I will show you, with you the, the screen again. But first I will explain to you. Oh no! First, I need I need to first show you this screen, and then I need to go back to, to 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 to, to this guy. Okay, so let me. Uh, run the chat. Okay. So now. So so far. For most of the time, we were enjoying the fact that. We had, let's say, we had our cord, we had our brain, right? And we had a cortical surface and we had our dipoles, which were orthogonal to the cortical surface, right? And then therefore at each location, we had a single dipole and life was beautiful, uh, but, you know, not realistic, okay? That's always like this. Okay. So anyway, uh, in order to have things be a little bit more realistic, let us talk about the uh, dipole model with arbitrary orientation. Okay. With an arbitrary orientation. Okay. So again, this is this brain, right? It has, we have certain, We have certain radius vector here. Uh, we have certain dipole located here. And this dipole may have, now we, are, we allow for this dipole to have, uh, to, have, to have different orientation, okay? And then you ask me, well, if it has different orientation, then how we describe it? Because, because there are so many possible orientations that it may have, then how we can generate the forward matrix? How can we make the scan? Right, because what we have to scan over all possible orientations, that would be impossible, right? No, things are much simpler uh, thanks to the linearity of Maxwell equations. Okay, uh, so this is this is x, this is y, this is z. Okay, so uh, the, 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 let me let, let me try to explain. Consider just this point, this this location here, and consider a dipole, but you can draw a local coordinate system for this dipole right here it may coincide it may be oriented exactly as the main one but it's aligned with the origin of this dipole right and this dipole let's say like this okay so uh this dipole may have uh th th this is a physical dipole okay this is a physical world it's just simply a stick which is sticking out from some location and making certain certain angles with x y plane with y axis with x axis and with z axis right and the cosines of these angles are basically the projections of this if you assume the dipole has unit lens right because we just talk about the the mathematical substrate, right, of this, uh, of the dipole, right? Assume that it has unit lens, then uh, if you multiply it by the cosine of this angle, you get the height here, the cosine of this angle, you get the projection onto y-axis, and cosine of this angle, uh, you get projections on the x-axis, right? X, y, and z, right? And therefore, this vector can be, of course, described by uh let's call it alpha beta and gamma those cosines right it can be multiplied uh by let's say vector q along x axis plus beta multiplied by vector q along y axis plus gamma multiplied up oh, sorry uh vector q z axis Okay, this is a three-dimensional vector. Okay, so this this is just a three-dimensional vector uh, of uh, 
it may be of unique lens, maybe not necessarily unique lens, but it, it's, uh, its orientation is encoded by these guys, by alpha, beta, and gamma, okay? Now, we want to know what kind of field or what kind of distribution of car of uh, electrical potential this dipole, this arbitrary orientation create, will create on the skull or around the skull, right? With, as measured with image sensors. What would be its topography, right? For that, we apply the Maxwell equations, right? So we apply the forward modeling based on the Maxwell equations and we apply it to this dipole, right? This, this, this is just geometric properties of our source, right? Okay. And now the crucial thing. The crucial thing is that Maxwell equations, as you probably looked at this, um, at the formula, they are linear. Meaning that if you have a dipole, let's say, let's let's remove this. If you have dipole Q1 and you have dipole Q2 and dipole Q1 produces certain field outside the brain and dipole Q2 produces certain field out of the brain, then the, the field produced by the two dipoles acting together or added together uh, is equal to simply two fields added together, okay? So if you have a, if you have, let's say, let's say, let's put it this way. If you have, and those are the vectors, right? So if you have, this is your vector, physical vector, Q1, this is in 3D space and then I physical space, right? And you have vector Q2, okay? And this, according to the, the, the parallelogram rule, right? This is vector Q1 plus Q2, right? Then the field produced by vector Q1 and Q2, the sum of these two, right? It's equal to Q3, for instance, right? Uh, is equal simply field of Q1 plus field of Q2. This is extremely convenient because you can describe any orientation of a dipole as a linear combination of dipoles that are oriented along some fixed axis, right? Along X, Y, and Z axis, right? Therefore, based on this linearity property, if you now look back at this equation, uh, you can rewrite that f of alpha qx plus beta qy plus gamma qz is equal to alpha. Yes, and of course, because of the linearity, of course, I could have put, in, put here some alpha and beta coefficients, and then I would have to take them out here, right? So the sum of, you know, you remember, right? In, the linearity, in linearity, you have these two properties, right? The scaling property and the additivity property, right? So the, the, if you combine the two, you get this expression, and then it will be alpha times F of QX plus beta times F of QY plus gamma times F of QZ, okay? And these are vectors. Again, Q, here, right, are the physical vectors in the physical space. F of QX, these guys already, right? They are n dimensional vectors, where n is the number of sensors, right? And they are they live in this abstract space, in the abstract n dimensional space, right? But these two spaces, they are related to each other. And in order to find the topography of a source with arbitrary orientation, all you need to know is you need to know the topographies of sources along oriented along three orthogonal directions, okay? Therefore, instead of matrix G, which used to be N sensors, times n sources, right? We will now, and it was fixed, it had fixed orientation, G-oriented. Uh, we now have matrix, which has 
n sensors multiplied by n sources multiplied by three, right? Because at each location in the brain, at each location in the brain, we will have a, if you take again the brain, uh, at each location in the brain, you will have three orthogonally oriented dipoles and you will find forward field for each of these three guys. And once you know them, you can then find exactly the field produced by any dipole with a, with any, any, any with dipole with any orientation located at this point. Okay. Therefore, now each location in the brain in this new matrix is served not by a single column, but by a triplet of columns. Okay. Okay. Now, is it clear? Mm, yes. You can ask questions, please. Come on. So basically, we, we we transitioned from the from the from the fixed orientation dipole model to the arbitrary orientation dipole model, and motivated. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, no. I'm just um, saying. Okay. Oh, ah, okay. 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 Yes. So now, uh, what, 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 what's next? Uh, uh, next, we want to see the following thing. We want to uh, somehow develop a procedure. Ah, yes. What well, other thing which I wanted to tell you? A little bit of physics. Okay. Remember, remember when we when we spoke about the forward model stuff, right? Remember that we always, in, in, when we talk about the forward model of MEG, right? I was telling you that if you have a radial radial source, radial not source, radial radial model, radial volume conduction model, then not spherical, radially oriented sources will produce primary sources, right? The field that they produce is exactly compensated by the fields produced by the secondary sources, right? That they induce in this volume in the conductive media, right? And therefore this radial sources will produce uh, zero MEG outside the, the, the sphere, spherical conductor, okay? Because the head to a large extent spherical uh, in MEG, if we talk about the triplets of dipoles, we have, if we talk, if we talk about the triplet of dipoles, only the two dipoles, the two components of these dipoles of this triplet are contributing to the signal outside the brain. Okay. Because if you, let's say again, I will draw your, again. well, yeah, I don't know why every time drawing it. Yeah. Here, if you, if you approximate it with a sphere, if you approximate the head with a sphere, this is your brain, this is the center. Um, then if you take, for instance, a source that is here, and let's you assume that the source is radially oriented, okay? Uh, not, 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 not this way, okay? If you assume that this, you, are, you are here, right? You can, you, can have, you can have a source here, potentially. No, this is not, yeah. You can have a source here, <laughs> but you, let's look at it. Not in the not in the coordinate system that is linked to the original coordinate system, okay. But then let's look at at the coordinate system which is which is specific to this location. So basically, you take the plane perpendicular to the radii, and you will have two two components in this plane, okay. So you have two components, one and one which pertain to this plane, and you have the third component, which is radio, okay? The reason I separated these, because the radial components doesn't com contribute to the field outside, okay? And therefore, you have only the two of them, which are linear combinations of the two origin of the three original components, right? This one is a linear combination, this one is a linear combination, this one is a linear combination. But just one of these linear combinations, will produce no field outside the brain. And therefore, going back to SVD or something, if you take SVD of the triplet of topographies 
corresponding to a source, to any source in the MEG forward model, you will have it's that, that you will have that only two of these components will have large contribution. We have large single values, and the third one will have the small one. Let's see it. Okay, we will now. I will. I will. I will share with you the the the, the screen again, and we will see it. Okay, and I will explain it again so that you. Just a second, you will understand it, I'm sure. Okay, now let's take it. So this is this is MEG for a model that I have generated and it's stored in matrix G3. It's, let's say size, let's say first we had size G ORT and now we have size G3. Okay, so you can see that the size of G3 is three times larger it has three times more columns than the 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 number of columns in G ORT because G ORT is a matrix that has that describes topography the dipoles which correspond to the topographies of dipoles oriented orthogonally. That's why it's ORT orthogonal to the cortical surface. Okay. Now let's take G. Uh, I call it small G, uh, uh, and let's say let it will be. G3, one, two, one, sorry. One, two, three, okay. And then let's do what we like most is SVD, too many SVD. If we look, uh, of course, for the, for the, for the size of S, it will be 100 by three, but we are interested only in the first three, right? Let's look as S13, S13, okay? So now, because it's, I use spherical model in this case, so very simple spherical model, therefore this guy is identical to zero. So you can see that we have, we can approximate this triplet, this triplet G, because look, look, look let, let, let's, let's just, let, 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 let's do it this way, okay? Figure plot g okay so see we have three components of the topo three topographies corresponding to, to three sources oriented orthogonally in the euclidean coordinate system okay in the euclidean and the xyz standard coordinate system the same for all locations okay for all sources but we can see from here that two of these guys are oriented I have high amplitudes, right? And this one has small amplitude. Most likely this one is oriented, you know, in such a location that that X axis aligns kind of close with, with the radial direction, you know, because if it's, if it's located somewhere here and then your X axis go here and radial direction co almost coincide with it, right? Then the amplitude of this guy is, is small, right? But the truth is that the among these three vectors and dimensional vectors, only two are linearly independent. Okay, and the third one can be expressed as a linear combination of the of the other two. Okay, that means that this triplet has certain orientation such that two vectors. The, the triplet, I mean, the, the, the dipole, okay, the, but the dipole itself has specific orientation such that two topography vectors will be non-zero and the third one will be zero, okay? So, and this orientation is given to you by the uh, single value decomposition vectors, elements of vector V, okay? Uh, and, and, you you get the the topographies of the two dipoles which lie in this plane perpendicular to the radius as the first two vectors of the le first two left singular vectors of the of the SVD. Okay, let's let's repeat it. Uh, USV of G. Okay, then you can uh, you 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 can plot C. You can plot uh u the first two vectors okay 
uh, you plot u the first two vectors, okay? These two vectors, they correspond, they, they correspond to the dipoles that lie in the plane perpendicular to the to perpendicular to the radius, okay? Because the third one, I know that the third one, it, it corresponds to the zero eigenvalue, the zero singular value. And it means that it aligns with the radius because I know the property of the electromagnetic forward model uh, for, for a spherical source, okay? And because SVD wants to find such an orientation of the sources that first you get the largest contribution, then you get the largest, the next largest. And then what's left, then nothing is left because your subspace, like be, remember in this, uh, in this situation where we have uh, one dipole and one time series, we had time series comprised, we have many time series, we had many channels and they were non-zero, right? But if you look into, into the structure, you get only one dipole and it's one time series, okay? The same here, we have, we have non-zero topographies, all three of them are non-zero. But if you look into the structure, the structure will tell you that there is there are only two components which are non-zero and the third component is, is zero, okay? And therefore, when trying to describe the field outside the head or outside the sphere, you need only two orthogonal directions in the court in the in the, in the forward model, and usually these orthogonal directions correspond to the dipoles which are placed in the tangential plane. Okay, and we don't explicitly compute the tangential plane; we just do this SVD and take only the first two components. Okay, it may be a little bit complicated, but I just wanted to explain you uh, to explain the reasons why sometimes in MEG-based software you will have not for a arbitrary rotating dipole, you will have not three components, but only two. These two will correspond to dipoles in the plane perpendicular to the radius because the dipole which is along the radius doesn't contribute to the field outside, okay? And therefore, never in these cases, in the in, the, in sometimes in some MEG software, uh, analysis of MEG sources, your matrix uh, G3, becomes in fact, sorry, becomes matrix G2, it's not present here, where per each source you have only two columns, okay? And these columns correspond to the topographies of two sources in the tangential plane, okay? For each location, okay? So, uh, but the, uh, uh, that that was just an explanation for you uh, why uh, uh, why you know why some in some software you may encounter the, um, the this thing. Okay, so now let's go back to the uh, to the. Uh, let me stop sharing here, otherwise it will be crazy. Uh, let me go to the. Samsung pad. All right, now let's try and look at something. At something similar, okay. Let's try and look at how we can, uh, how we can we do a scan for the model where we don't know the orientation of a source, okay. So how can we, basically, basically our goal will be this: we still we will still have a we will still have our data. Oops, sorry, this is not something I expected. Uh, yeah, very bad. Okay, so yes, okay, so we will be again, we will be playing with the data with some, let's say, rank one. It doesn't really matter for now, uh, but we will be playing with a single time slice again. It will be T0, T0 here, okay. Um, but now, instead of finding vector G of R star, that is uh, such that cosine of vector G at R star between between the between this vector G of R star and your data is maximized. Okay, now 
our g of r star is given to us by uh by basically a more complicated thing okay it's given to us by uh by by a matrix usually in eg case and in some realistic like if you have realistic more mg modeling right it's given by a matrix that has uh now your g of r star becomes becomes a matrix of r star and it comprises gx of r star gy of r sorry let me remove this yeah and then your g of r star it is a matrix in this case and here you have a vector g r star x g r star y and g r star z okay and these are all vectors okay and basically you need to find again you you, you the same quest you have to find such a location in the brain and such an orientation su such a combination of orientations such a combi linear combination of this gx gy and gz that it gives you the best match with your data okay therefore uh you can think of this of this problem as this so you have your data x of t this is your matrix g it has to be it has to be multiplied by some orientation vector right let's say theta and then it may be multiplied by s of t okay no and then plus some noise noise of t okay um okay so this is again this becomes a topography right this becomes again a vector because you have a vector which is n by three multiplied by the orientation vector which is three by one and then again you get g oriented which is just a vector multiplied by s of t plus n of t okay now let's see how you can do it let me I had somewhere the notes, um, not to make, no, 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 not to make a mistake. Well, we are going through all this. Yeah, but let's let's try to stick to exactly the same recipe. Okay. Now, let's assume that uh, our data x are uh, at some uh, we have and, and let's again you know what for simplicity let us combine the scalar time time series s of t and vector orientation theta okay so that assume that we if it's a rotating dipole uh at each time moment it may be it may have different orientation right and therefore vector theta may actually serve the role of a basically source time series right but it now will have because we have three dipoles we will have three time series but if this dipole has fixed but unknown, fixed in time but unknown orientation then our result our matrix vector a for each time slice will be the same will be have will have the same orientation but might have different amplitudes right but if it's a rotating dipole model then we don't have any restrictions on vector a but since we are now looking at a, a single time slice okay we are still looking at a single time slice let us assume that uh, we have a which is now a vector and we want to describe our vector x at time zero t0 right our measurements at t0 here as before right uh, uh with this vector okay and then again we want to minimize this okay where the story is very similar except that now this has become a vector or a matrix okay and now we don't have a single coefficient but we have a um, we have a, a vector right which corresponds to uh which basically has in it the component of orientation and of magnitude right with which the source is active okay now let us uh, let, let me give you one trick so that not, not to take the derivatives and not to complicate things if you have something like this and if you have a if you have usually matrix equation you can assume 
you can assume that this is a normal matrix equation where mm, number of columns, number of rows is the same in everything is solvable. Then of course, in order to find A in this case, uh, you need to do, you need to take G, you have to multiply, uh, in, compute the inverse of G and multiply it by vector X and you get A, right? And then things will be simple, right? You can then substitute this into here and, and, and that's it, right? But it's not the case, right? Because because your G is, let's say, 102 by three, okay? And, and A, of course, is three by one, right? And therefore, there is no such thing like an inverse of G that is not, not, not square, right? Therefore, in this case, you do the streak, this is called so-called, this is called basically pseudo inverse. Uh, there is this mnemonic trick how you can compute this. So basically, let's do this. Let's multiply uh, both sides of this equation by G transpose, okay? So G transpose X, we can do that, why not, right? Is equal to G transpose G times A, okay? Now we don't forget that G is now a matrix, right? Although I kind of went away from the agreement that we have that matrices are always large letters, but maybe let's make, let, let's make, let's make, let's make it, let, let's go back, right? Let, 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 let's, let's, let's make vectors. Let, let's, let, let's, let's make them. Uh, I will make this here, a note here uh, for, for, oh, no, 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 stick, stick, stick here. Okay, forget about it. So G is a matrix, right? This is 102 by three, so it's defined here. So good. All right, so now uh, multiply this, right? Now, in order to isolate A, and this matrix, it used to be, because this is 102 by three, G transpose is three by 102, then three by 102 multiplied by 102 by three is just a three by three matrix, which in the non-MEG case, okay, is non-singular. But in MEG case, it's singular, but we can always compute pseudo inverse of this, of this matrix itself or project it into the smaller dimensional space, but let's not bug your brain with this for now. Uh, so basically, let's write, uh, let's multiply both sides by G transpose G inverse. So it will be G transpose G inverse multiplied by G transpose X is equal. If I multiply by the inverse of this, this will of course go, right? And I will get my A isolated, okay? So this is my A, very similar formula, right? Remember, remember expression when we had in the beginning, uh, it's here. See, uh, here, G trans G star T, see here, uh, G star T uh, divided by G star T, G star. But because G star was a vector, G star G was a scalar, and therefore this is just a simple division. But in this case, when G has become a matrix, we, we, we have its inverse, uh, multiplied by G transpose from, you know, multiply G transpose from the left, right? But otherwise, conceptually, it's exactly the same story, right? Now, if we, now we take this and we do the same trick and we substitute it here, okay? So we, um, we do, uh, we do X minus uh here it's important to not to goof in terms of uh in terms of yeah let's let's put g this one g and then multiply by g transpose g minus first g transpose times x okay and then again this we want to minimize see the logic the, the, the logic is exactly the same except that except that now uh, we have uh, these G's are the matrices, okay? Okay, so now, uh, and, and this one gives you a vector, a linear combination that you can then multiply this vector G, which gives you the optimal topography and, 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 and that's it, right? And then, so uh, now, let us try. Let us try to expand this whole thing. And but but we will now try to use. Uh, we will now try to use SVD. Okay. So let me first see that I didn't make mistake because if I made mistake here, then 
I mean, yeah, it's squared here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now again, our goal here is to reduce this thing to a very nice and clear, clearly understandable notion of cosines. Okay. But of course, because we are now in two dimensions here or three dimensions, right? Because our G now is three dimensional, we will have some modification of this cosine thing, right? But it will anyway be something interpretable, right? Something, something quite readily interpretable. Okay. So now let's see how we can do it. Basically, let's assume that G can be represented as U S V transpose. Okay. Which is any matrix can have this kind of SVD representation, right? And then let us simply uh, let us simply substitute it. Okay, I will be copying it from here because I because I just did it today in the morning, uh, so that I don't I don't, I don't I don't make mistake. Okay, so first this G. Okay, so let let let's take this and uh, and expand it here. Right. So first G U S V transpose. Right, multiplied by bracket. Okay, G transpose is what V S U transpose, agreed? I, I didn't transpose S because S is a diagonal matrix, okay? So I, no need to transpose it, okay? Multiplied by G, which is U, S, V transpose, right? By the second G, right? Uh, inverse of it, multiplied by U, ah, not, sorry. Multiplied by G transpose, right? Which means V, S, U transpose and multiplied by X, right? So again, these are all matrices now. And this is the vector, okay? So now let's, now let's look here. The, U is an orthogonal matrix, right? And because U is orthogonal matrix, uh, it has orthogonal columns at their all unit norm. Therefore, if you take U transpose U, you'll get just an identity matrix, right? Because each column is orthogonal, meaning that all diagonal to each to another column, except for itself, of course, uh, uh, you will have zero of diagonal elements. And on the diagonal, you will have zeros because columns of U are unit norm, right? Therefore, therefore, this goes right. S S transpose uh, is basically uh, is 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 basically uh, S squared, right? And then let's let, 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 let's just simply write this. U uh, sorry. Uh, it will be U S V transposed multiplied V S squared because it's just a diagonal matrix, right? We could just raise the elements of the diagonal matrix to the square, and that will be the square of the matrix. In general, square square of the matrix is the product of two matrices, right? Of, of the matrix by itself, right? Multiplied by V transpose minus minus first, right? multiplied by V S U transpose multiplied by X. Okay. Now, let's see. Okay. Now this guy, inverse of this guy, it's actually very simple. Look at this. Uh, typically, if you, if you have a product of, uh, if you have a product of matrices and we, we compute the inverse of it, technically A times B inverse is equal B inverse times a inverse, okay? And here, I don't know, if I have a tradition where I typically say why this is the case, why we change the order of the two matrices. If you want to, I, I, I can, I, I let me describe because I, you know, tradition is everything, okay? So see, the matrix is an operator, right? Is an operator acting on some vectors in this space, right? And the space has certain rules, right? It, it has certain continuity, right? It has it has the notion of distances, right? Where we can talk about points which are close to each other, right? And etc. Okay. Therefore, uh, therefore, it has some some specific properties, okay? And I can show you an example. Assume that your assume that your B is a red sock, okay? Is your red sock? Sorry, don't have a hand slipped. Okay, there's a red sock, and assume that your A A is a blue sock. Okay, uh, now assume that you put these socks onto your foot, for instance, right? Then you first put uh, B onto your foot, right? So that your B B B is B is, B is red one, right? B is the red one, so you put it right, and then A 
is the blue one, right? You put you put you put A to your foot, right? Okay. Now you want to take off your 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 this pair of socks, right? And you basically uh, you may take 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 them off your foot, and you get two of them inverted. But before we do this, we let, let, let's look at these two guys. We assume that this is your foot here, okay? Uh, and your your red sock is applied to the foot first, and then blue sock is applied to the result of red foot red red sock being applied to the foot, okay? So now, if you if you take them off, if you take them off, if you invert it, basically, right? Then what you get? You get your uh, you get your you, you get your blue sock, and then you get your red sock, and it's both of them are inverted, right? So I put inverted, and this guy blue is inverted, right? And now if you assume that you want to apply these two guys onto another food, right? Uh, then you will first apply inverse blue sock and then inverse red sock, right? But before, when you were applying not inverted operator, you were first applying red direct and blue direct. But when you invert it, you inverted blue and you inverted red and you apply first inverted. And therefore, when you have operator AB, when you invert it, and what is operator AB? First apply B, then you apply A, right? Uh, then the inverted operator is B inverse times A inverse. So now you first apply A inverse, and then you apply then you apply B inverse. Okay, this is actually not a not something that I made up. It's uh, I was told the story by uh, Solomon Golom, who is a he died recently. He's a super mathematician. It was back at USC. He's the one who uh, who is the author of the uh, Read Solomon codes that we use when we write on CDs. Okay, uh, or used to write <laughs> used, but used in different applications as well. And um, uh, he also the author of Pentamino of the game where you have this. Uh, <laughs> special shaped hexagons and he described all these rules and the fact that it happens this way is not because it's just happened this way right just because the matrices are real objects that describe this real life this real world and therefore they stick to the properties of this real world and therefore the sock that is another manifold right living on this object uh when applied to feet to, to a foot which is an object in this real world when they interact, you get pretty much the same picture as you get in the abstract world of matrices. Okay, so anyway, that was the long story. But all I wanted to uh, to do here is to just take the inverse of this guy. Okay, and the inverse of this guy will be basically if you if you if you if you, if you, if you were to do it in a proper way, you would take v transpose inverse multiplied by s squared inverse multiplied by v right so but because uh, because it's an orthogonal matrix uh v transpose inverse so let me put it this way because v transpose inverse it's equal to v transpose transpose it's equal to v right because v is an orthogonal matrix and the definition of the inverse is that when the matrix multiplied by uh, multiplied by itself, uh, trans uh, by, by, by its inverse, or its inverse of a matrix multiplied by original matrix gives you identity matrix. For any orthogonal matrix, this is true, right? So you take V transpose V is equal to identity, given that given that V is orthogonal, right? So uh, now, and that, then let's rewrite this expression here u s v transpose well and then inverse inverse of s squared is simply because it's a diagonal matrix all you need to do is you just take the one over the, the these elements of the diagonal right and therefore we will write here v right multiplied by s minus two which means that we just took, took the diagonal elements and inverted them um, and multiplied by v transpose and then multiplied by v, multiplied by s, multiplied by u, and multiplied by x. Okay. All right. So now, uh, 
obviously, this one is an orthogonal matrix, this go, right? Uh, and this one, they, they go, they give identity, right? And then C, you get S multiplied by S minus two multiplied by S. So it means that these two also go. And what we end up with, we end up with a very simple thing multiplied by x. And you would probably see no difference with this expression that we were deriving, but since we're vectors, right? With this expression, with the, with the set of expressions here, this one, um, this one, this one probably, yeah. Because B is a normalized version of matrix, of vector, right? And now we have exactly the same thing, except that the vector B in the simple one-dimensional case turned into a matrix U, which is also orthogonal, right? Orthonormal, has orthonormal columns, uh, and it's multiplied by X. Exactly the same thing, right? Except that those are the matrices, but the picture is pretty much the same and you get your functional now, you transpose X, um, and uh, and this is a vector, this is a vector, and you want to minimize it, okay? So what does this mean? What is the recipe? The recipe is this. You go, you, you, you basically have to go and for each, I, for each I source, for each I source, you can take vector G, matrix G, which, is created by G, uh, how to say, yeah, yeah, let me, let me put it, which is created by GX of vector ice, right? I, ice location, G, Y, ice location, G, Z, ice location, right? Then you take, then you take uh, SVD of this thing, right? And you represent G, as u as v transpose okay then you take the call the first two, the, the, the well in this case yeah the first three columns of u in general and you compute this structure but you don't have to compute this whole structure right all you have to do as before you have to compute only this guy right you have compute only this guy which is projection of x onto the column space of U, right? The coefficients of projection. And you have to maximize these coefficients, right? Okay, the same as before, your model was, uh, your model was given by a single vector and you were, you were trying to find such a model that fits the data well, right? But it was single vector and you just were minimizing the cosines. Now, your model is given by two vectors now or three vectors, okay? This this U it, and it's it it's orthogonalized versions are in U, and to measure how well this guy fits into this model, you simply have to compute the projection coefficients, the coefficients of decomposition of your data, in the coordinate system defined by this model, by this U, right, for the i location, and then how you measure that they fit well? Well, just sum the squares of these, right, and then. And then once you sum the squares of this, you can say that you can say that yes, my source fits well. My my source fits well to to this particular. Uh, my data fits well to to this particular location of the source, and not to that one, for instance. Okay, so uh, and then and therefore you gain you, 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 this way you gain basically independence of source orientation. You observe that since remain philosophically, if you will, pretty much the same. All you do is you just measure how, like if you if you consider a situation where you have three dimensions here, this is vector u1, u, u2, and this is vector u3, okay? This, this is the coordinate system in this abstract space, right? Or the same dimensional space. And and this is your, this is your, 
model vector. And you have to understand that we are limited here, right? We are in two dimensions, we are in three dimensions and I have drawn to you three dimensional thin, right? Therefore, of course, each vector in a three dimensional coordinates in a three dimensional world will project, uh, will be totally described by the projection on three orthogonal vectors, right? But imagine now the situation when we are in three dimensional world, but we have only two vectors, basically we have a plane and we have another vector, which is my, you know, something which is not in this plane, but like sticks out of this plane, but you know, partly lies in this plane, but partly not. And then the amount to which this guy lies in this, in this plane can be described by the basically uh, subspace correlation between your data vector and your and this and the model, right? And this this is measured simply by the cosines or by projections of this vector onto this plane, right? So you can draw it this way, approximately. For example, like you have a plane, plane, and you have and this is let's say u one and u two. Let's say two of them only, right? And then you have a and then you have a uh, data vector for instance, right? And this data vector can be decomposed into, into two components, right? This is in 3D. Uh, this component that is orthogonal to this U1, U2 plane, and this other component that pertains to this plane, right? And the amount to which this guy pertains can be assessed by the amount of projection of this vector onto U1 and of this vector or this vector original one onto U2, okay? And then you simply sum the square root of the coefficients and that's your measure of how well your model fits the data. And without restriction that your model is and is only one dimensional, right? In the next, we will uh, try to look at the situation where we, uh, where our, not only the model is two dimensional, uh, or n-dimensional, three-dimensional, no more usually, uh, but also the data are n-dimensional. And then we have full-blown subspace correlation metrics, which will allow us to localize several dipoles from the data simultaneously, okay? But let's now, I, I, I know it may be complicated, but you have to, again, why? I don't know why it died. Uh, it may be complicated, but, uh, let me try to turn it on again. Piece of crap, why? Uh, ah, okay, I realize it's slow. Okay. Run. Okay, yeah, so, uh, no, doesn't want to share. But anyway, let's switch to this, uh, let, let's, let's leave it. Leave it intact. This is a piece of crap. Let's let me share with you my main screen, and we play we, we play some more with the data. Okay, the script, right? So again, uh, let us try to do this very similar thing as I described, and this is just computing the difference, and this is computing the norm of this projection. I will explain you just step by step. Just just so just first let, let let's generate the data. Mm. Let's generate the data. Let's display the topography. Okay. Display the topography. Remove this. Okay. And then uh, that's our simple scan, right? Which we already did. Not very interesting. Let's relax the orientation constraint. Okay. So again, see. Now, I, I, this is only portion of the code that I want you to pay attention to, okay? Here. Yeah. So, because I will not be explaining the rest, of course. Uh, so, see, the matrix G3 is the matrix that has a triplet of columns per each location, okay? So now, you, we go and we take ith triplet, okay? And this is the range is go, going from one to three. So for i equal one, we will have G1, G3 first column, G3 second column, G3 second as the third column, okay? 
So, and this will be G. Let's 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 say I is equal one, for instance, right? Uh, and let's initialize range, and let's say G G is this, right? Then size G. Clearly, there's 102 number of sensors by three, right? Now, our quality metrics here is not, we are not trying to maximize, but we are trying to minimize this residual, okay, first. I just want to show you this is the same, okay? So as maximizing the, so then you, 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 you minimize the norm. So basically all you have to do, you compute this. Oops, sorry. You compute this and this is some quantity okay this is just some number okay just some number and so this we, we go through all uh for, for each source we do this okay and then we plot a scan plot the scan let's close all and then plot the scan close all and let's plot the scan okay and let's draw a color bar Color bar, okay. And then you can see because it's because now we are looking, remember we were minimizing the residuals, right? The, the X minus G, whatever's in X, right? Uh, then we need to look for the location with the smallest Q, SC, Q scan, right? Q that's from, from quality, okay? Uh, and scan is just scan, you know, quality metric scan, something like this, okay? So the two things we need to observe here. First of all, compared to the previous pictures, this has become much smoother, right? This is good because, because it's, it means that it's much more stable as compared to the additive noise, okay? And to some errors in the model and other stuff, okay? Um, and of course, yes, because now these are the residuals, we are spotting the location with the smallest value of this residual, okay? And and it, we can see that it's like, it's not strict, but we can see that it coincides with the true location of the of the cortical, uh, cortic of, of the source that we have simulated, okay? Now we can do exactly the same thing, but we just, we'll be not looking for the norm of the residual, but we will be looking for the norm of the projection of X onto, this G pseudo inverse G G G. This is exactly uh, what I in, in the middle of uh, in the middle of uh, our derivation we had this construction, right? But in this case, G was just the forward uh, the, the, is is just the forward model uh, with three columns each, right? The the reason I use pin here is because it's pseudo inverse because I because this matrix G G prime times G is rank two because of the reason I described to you, because I, G is forward model for the sphere and for the spherical forward model, the 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 dipoles uh, inside the, the sphere contribute on, only only two components contribute and the radial component doesn't contribute. Of course, okay. So basically G is a column, so G are linearly dependent. And therefore, if you take G transpose G, we get the matrix that has rank deficiency. So it's rank two instead of rank three. Therefore, it's pseudo inverse. But it's exactly the same thing as this expression before, right? Where we, uh, here, let me show you. Yeah, let me see. Wait just a second. Uh, this is this is this this is basically a, a very similar to this guy right uh and to our expressions in the like uh, unfortunately i can't i can connect to them right now but anyway so see this is the uh the, 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 this is this is this procedure where we are where we said that we are, will be maximizing the cosine and not minimizing the residuals right so let's do the same thing let's compute this and then plot this scan. Okay, we get exactly the same thing, except that it's turned from the head. Uh, okay, let me evaluate it, and then and then and then make color bar, color bar here. Yeah. Uh, so you don't. It's it's not normalized yet, right? But it's uh, it's uh, it's the maximum corresponds to the to the true location, and you can see the maximum is kind of smooth. You can you can try to show only uh, the vertices which are above 0 
of the maximum, okay? Yeah, they're here. And so basically it shows, I mean, if your model is slightly inaccurate or your data have noise, then you will localize a source that will be kind of close to the true location, right? It will not be in these arbitrary places where, uh, where the, remember this simple one dimensional scan uh, gave, uh, uh, resulted, you know, in this non, very non-smooth, very, very, very bumpy map. Uh, and this is especially true and especially useful for the cases where we don't know the actual orientation of the source, right? It still can vary uh, and we can capture it and we, be, we can be invariant to this orientation. But, and, and for this, we get smoothness, right? Uh, but of course, the smoothness also comes from the fact that if we displace our source, we can compensate for it by changing its orientation, right? Therefore, this approach on the one hand, of course, it helps us, especially in the case when we have uncertainty with respect to the true source orientation. But it, on the other hand, this, so, the, 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 this approach, of course, kind of reduces spatial fidelity, right? But we don't want in this situation spatial fidelity because, because the spatial fidelity may result in a very big instability of the solution, right? Because if you have a solution in this particular location and many other locations have also values which are very close to this maximum value observed, right? Of this co correlation, right? But they're kind of far away from the true location, then any noise may make you make a decision based on this peak may pick you, may, 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 may result in your picking the maximum, which is far away from the true location, okay? Therefore, smoothness is good here, okay? Of course, if it's over smooth, if it's over the entire head, then of course, nobody needs this kind of solution, right? Okay, and then now go to, to, to our recipe with SVD. So basically what we do, we take again a triplet for each location. We take SVD of this triplet, and then we simply compute the coordinates of x n in the coordinate system defined by these basis vectors, right? Let us do it for i equal one, okay? So let's make it this way. So see, u one times three times u one times three, is, uh, or maybe you can, sorry, one times three, yeah? yeah. So it basically, you can say that from here, you can say that U is orthonormal, right? Orthogonal matrix has column, uh, each, each, each column is orthogonal to each other, to another, and the norm of each column is one, right? It's basically a basis. In this space defined by the forward model, corresponding to the eyes, in our case, the first source, okay? And then all you do, you just measure the correlation, not the correlation, the projection of your data, the coordinates of your data in this coordinate system, okay? And then sum the squares and take the square root of this projection coefficients, okay? Because see, again, why we get the variation? Again, let's do it, but you will just see exactly the same picture. Uh, the only ad advantage of this is that it will be, yeah, let's do it this way. Uh, yeah, let's do it first this way, and then I'll show you another way. Okay. You get pretty much the same. And and the same thing, just to show you the exact equivalence of, of this thing that we were, when we were deriving in the middle, and this thing that we arrived at when we approximated G, not, not approximate, represented G with USV, the single value decomposition, right? Exactly the same story. And in order to things look nice, in order to, you know, because you never know this peak, is it really true peak? Is it like, you, you, you would need to do statistics for that. But if you have some metrics that is normalized, that will be good, okay? Then to do this normalized, you just take your xn, your vector xn, and you normalize it by its norm, okay? You normalize it, and then you project the normalized vector. And then you will get a beautiful scan where you have normalized values, okay? Normalized values, you get between one, zero and one. And you can judge, you can put a threshold, say if this correlation is below, let's say 0.9, 
uh, then I'm not interested in anything. Okay, so but if you if it's let's say if it's a point above point nine, then those allocations of my potential sources, right? We close all here. Uh, here, yeah, beautiful. And then you can make it. You could test it. You can say that what if it will be point nine eight, for instance? I don't know. I'm just making it up. Yeah, see. So there are two things to say about this. First, this estimate, as we increase, you know, this threshold, right? That point point nine nine. Let's put point nine nine for instance. So I'll show you why. Well, I'll tell you why why I'm doing this. Yeah, it looks like this estimate is what we will call later unbiased estimate. Okay, it gives you the location exactly at where the source, the maximum corresponds exactly at location where the source is. Yeah, the maximum is kind of smooth, right? And you have several locations around which have high values, but still it's very close to the true location, which is very good, okay? Which is very good because, because it means that you will not erroneously estimate the location of your stores, right? Um, and uh, you can also now, uh, oh, it's, is it the end? No, it's not the end. But it's close. Okay. So yeah. So and then you can uh yeah, so basically uh uh yeah, basically uh yeah, so so this can uh, then this this can gives you the unbiased uh, unbiased estimator of location of a source, at least in the case where there is a single source, so there is a big probability that there is a single source or a single in practice, of course, you will never have a single source, but you have situations where you are looking for a single source and the single source occupies, let's say 99 or 95% of power in your data, okay? So um, yeah, and that, that that's basically an, an analog of the music scan but for the situation where we have only a single time series in the data, okay, we hit single time slice in your data, but we have our model, which is a vector model, where we have like theoretically rotative dipole and the model represented by the triplet of, by the triplet of vectors. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to tell you today, because going into the second second round will be will be you know will require us to 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 to, to in other mathematics, okay, another set of mathematics, and I'm not sure you are ready for this, and I'm not sure I'm ready for this. Uh, so I would love to answer your questions, any. No questions? Well, it's good on the one hand. Uh, and are you with me? That's what I guessed. Top share. Ah, you're with me, you're with me, right? Yeah. Ah, okay. So no questions, so what? Let me let me ask you que uh, the questions to you, okay? So where were you lost? At which point? Um, for me, it was the start. Um, maybe not the start, but uh, twenty minutes after the beginning of the second lecture. Aha! Uh -huh, twenty minutes uh, of the beginning of uh, the second. When. Uh, yes, yeah. when we started, uh, when we uh, started another mathematical stuff and uh, finished this, um, I can I can show you where, but I can yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, but I I can look myself. Yeah, let me tell you. Yeah, okay. Uh, when when did you did you track me when I was talking to you about the triplet of dipoles? Yes. So that was okay, right? So you understood yes. that the triplet of dipoles, mm -hmm. physical mm -hmm. triplet, a physical triplet of dipoles transition translates into the triplet of topographies, right? Which are mm -hmm. not physical, mm -hmm. which are in this high dimensional space. Right. Okay. Uh then you, then I went about the tangential plane, and that was mm -hmm. the explanation. That was okay, right? That was okay, right? Yes. All right. 
Uh, and then I started to basically generalize. I started to say that, okay, now assume that you have a, that, that your source mm-hmm. has a known orientation, mm-hmm. right? Yes, uh, right and in this, this part, starting this, this, from this. Maybe this, I was too tired to... <laughs> No, maybe of course this is this is that's a lot of stuff, yeah. but but see, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you want to say something? Yes, I just um, I mean, I just need to rewatch uh, because um, my my force is uh, only enough for uh, качественно uh, listening to one lecture. Quali- ah, been... no, oh, no, oh, not qualitatively, but just качественно properly. I would say, yeah, yeah. yeah no, mm-hmm. this is complicated, and and I'm sorry that we have to do two lectures in a row. Uh, for me, it's also not easy because because you know I have to sit and you know with my with my psychics I can't sit for like more than two hours in a row. So <laughs> anyway, uh, and uh, 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 yeah, but the idea is I I can try to show. By the way, is it time that we have to finish the lecture or we still have ten minutes or something? Mm, I don't know exactly. Maybe I think it's time. It, it's something like uh, to. Half past two. Ah, half past two. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah. So then you have that done. Yes. Yeah. So basically, yeah, the idea is very simple. If you look at this equation where I introduce this orientation, all I just wanted to say is that, well, this triplet, it's there, right? Mm-hmm. And you don't know how it's oriented, okay? You don't know mm-hmm. how it's oriented. Be- before, you didn't know where the dipole was. Here, you don't know not only where the dipole is, but also how it's oriented. But yes. because it's mm-hmm. all linear, orientation is just simply a linear combination you can when you do it mathematically properly you can arrive at almost like mnemonically exactly the same solution which involves measuring the projection of your data onto the subspace of your model mm-hmm. that's all basically that's all you had to understand i mean you know so that and and like if you are if you are imagine that if i ask you here is a plane in three dimensions here is the vector Okay, here is a vector. Okay, mm-hmm. so tell me how much this vector belongs to this plane less than this vector. Okay, what you will mm-hmm. do? You will say, give me the give me the basis in this plane. You say, okay, here is the basis. Okay, fine. Then you take this vector and you project onto one basis vector and onto another basis vector. You find two coefficients. You mm-hmm. take the sum of mm-hmm, them mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's your measure that's your measure how well this guy fits the plane because if it's orthogonal then mm-hmm. will be zeros right if it's right in this guy then the sum of squares if if it's unit lengths then the sum of squares will be one yes. that's the largest uh-huh. possible that's all you know the only thing uh-huh. that is called generalizes to like instead of having, having single vector you have a matrix Mm-hmm. But expressions are exactly the same, and conceptually, it's exactly the same. It's just measuring the angle with respect to a vector is something easy to, something you used to, and measuring an angle with respect to a plane is something more complicated. But it mm-hmm. gives you a recipe that you have to just take the basis vector, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. like the plane is your basis set, right? Like, like you, if you ask you how much this oscillation pertains to this frequency range, mm-hmm. like not all possible frequencies, but let's say alpha. You mm-hmm. take several basis vectors in the alpha range, like 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 hertz, and you measure the cosine, basically, projection yes, of the beta this, uh-huh, onto this, uh-huh. and you sum the squares of these cosines, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the measure how much this time series b- remem- resembles alpha oscillation within this alpha range. If it's mm-hmm, very mm-hmm. Fast, then the sums will be small because the projections will be small. If it's very slow, it also will be small. But if it's more or less resembles the speed of the oscillation, then it will be large. Exactly mm-hmm. the same, but in space. And, mm-hmm. in, and and only that the, the basis vector, the reason I started talking about the basis is derived from the data is not just out of coincidence, you know, because mm-hmm. I knew mm-hmm. what we were going to face today. Uh, and in the case of the forward modeling and inverse modeling here, our basis are derived from these triplets. For mm-hmm. each triplet have its basis. And as a hint, this basis in MEG, it corresponds to three, each each column in this basis corresponds to, to triplet of dipoles, but the dipoles in MEG will be oriented in such a way that the first two will be in tangential plane. How they will mm-hmm. be rotated, I don't know, depends on. Mm-hmm. But the third one will be radial. Mm-hmm. 
as because the third one contributes nothing to your to the data and therefore in MEG you have to technically take only the two so you has to have only two columns you don't have to have the third one we did the third one but you know it's we, for that we had to use pseudo inverse if it took the uh -huh. two only then we didn't have to use the pseudo inverse so yeah mm -hmm. so that's it so conceptually, it may be a little complicated when we're deriving it, but conceptually, but the goal of the class is to actually show that, uh -huh. show this continuity of the ideas, okay? That it's not just something, you know, in one branch it is this, in the other branches is that. No, no, everything, well, very much in all this data analysis, things are very similar. And this is the thing I started the class with, this cosine, this projection is the foundation of almost everything. You know, all, all data analysis. No, really. So yes, now I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. And by the way, you leave the um, the Google document almost unattended. Uh, please, nice. the Google document with questions. The Google mm -hmm. document. So please, if you have questions, do ask them. But I think we need to give a homework for you so that you get yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah. No particular ones last time yeah. we were asked what what type type of homework would be better it's for something us. will be like a theoretic it's a couple of theoretical questions where you have to derive something and there'll be some practical things you'll give them some mm -hmm. some vectors you need to do something with them and you know or you have to give me simulate something we'll give you a script and we have several tasks we just think which we have a lot mm -hmm. of them you know just you need to assemble each particular homework you know on the fly you know depending on the mm -hmm. class okay it, it's good to have a homework i think yeah yeah it's very good to have a homework and uh it's good to have dasha who will be able to grade <laughs> Yes, because if Dasha wouldn't wouldn't be around, it would be impossible to give the homework, any kind of homework. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Take care.